We are delighted to be welcoming the star of Horrible Histories, the Paddington film, and now the author of The Wizard in the Shed, Mr. Simon Farnaby. How are you, Simon? How are you doing? Hello, boys. I'm good. All <laughs> the better for seeing you two chaps. <laughs> You're just saying that, Simon. <laughs> Stop it. I am just saying that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think the first question we have to ask is, how has lockdown been treating you? Yeah, not bad, actually. Um, well, I, I actually got the virus early on. All right. And my wife, yeah. Um, so we got it out of the way before even lockdown. So I've just been, you know, come on, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Catch up. No, um, and uh, uh, we just finished doing a series called Ghosts that's on yeah. BBC One. So it's this horrible histories team, and we do a show called Ghosts. And we just been, got it under the, uh, got it in the can, just yeah. as lockdown started. So uh, I planned the rest of the year because I don't like to do too much acting because you have to get up too early in the morning. <laughs> so um, I planned the rest of the year to just do writing anyway. So. Yeah it's actually worked out all right. Like it hasn't had too much of an impact. Right, um, right, super. Um, well, we are really pleased that you could join us today on the UK's number one educational comedy podcasts. Uh, as far as we, we know, there's only probably three educational comedy podcasts out there, but we are number one. Uh, yeah, number we, should, one. we should make it clear to Simon though that it, uh, you don't learn too much by listening, maybe to Lee, uh, you can learn quite a bit from me. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> you're probably going to, like, how do you unlearn? <laughs> do you yeah. learn? Yeah, regress. Yeah, the that's the word. word. Yeah, yeah get um, more stupid listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I apologise if your writing's not as good after this interview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's all um, down from here. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 you know, the podcast for everyone who's listened before, you'll know it just takes a lighthearted look at life in the classroom. But one thing that I, well, we, can I say we? Uh, well, it depends <laughs> what you're going to say. <laughs> no, is just sort of one of the most important aspects of, of school is obviously reading. Um, and you have written, is this your, um, your first children's book, is that right? It is, yeah. And it's, it's called... Children's book. Well, I've got, I've got my copy here as well. Oh, you've got one there. Well done. Yeah. He's, going, he's going full Graham Norton here. He's like, <laughs> I've got my copy here. <laughs> got my hot copy yeah, here. Yeah, um, plugging it. I'm not, I'm not going to go full Graham Norton. and say I've read it all yet. I've, I've started it reading it with my kids. Um, and it's actually been the first book we've started reading. Where, where was that page? You know, like when you bend the corner of a page to What's know you where you're up to? Like page five. 16? So not to, that's longer than I've ever read in any no, book. No, but we, we obviously during summer we've, um, we've, we've took our foot off the pedal as far as home learning. And so we've, the kids have got into the routine of just before bed watching Friends. We started watching Friends from the beginning. So the other night when I said, right, getting back, we're going to read this book. We're going to, it's, it's Simon of Horrible Histories. Um, you, yeah, you had to compete with Ross and Rachel and Joey. So yeah. We didn't get very far, but I, I'm loving it. I'll tell you what I like about it um, from what I've read so far, and it's on the first few pages, is you really get a sense from everything that I've seen you in with Horrible Histories and everything like that. Uh, your sort of author voice really comes through based on what you, how you present yourself on screen, if that makes sense. So, yeah. you know, uh, really funny. Uh, and even within that first chapter, there's quite a few sort of knowledge little drops of knowledge about that time in, in, in history, uh, which I thought was, was sort of great. But um, I'll, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll pa pass it over to you and I'll let you just sort of talk, talk through what the book's about um, and, and, you know, what, where it's, what you'd say it was sort of aimed at age-wise. Uh, so, yeah, if you want to talk us through that. Yeah, um, so it's a, it's, um, it starts in the dark ages and it, you meet a... Uh, a wizard, well, he doesn't like being called a wizard. He's a warlock called Murdin the Wild, and he, he's, he's a criminal, really, and he's on trial, and then he, he gets sent, sentenced to uh, the rivers of purgatory, so hell, yeah. but his, his, his rival, his enemy, sends him to the rivers of time instead so to try and get rid of him forever. 
and he ends up in modern day um, Bashingford, we, we call it, uh, like a town, sort of fictional town. Um, and there he meets a girl called Rose, who she wants to be a singer and win like Britain's Got Talent, you know. Yeah. And so they form an unlikely friendship. And, uh, and yeah, you're right to say like, horrible histories and my sort of sense of humor, I hope obviously is in there, but like, um, because he is from the past and he's from the dark ages and someone was asked, asking me about this, you know, a few days ago, like how, how my experience on something like Horrible Histories, um, you know, how, how it's useful in writing a book like that. And I suppose it's the voices, you know, that I, there's, I enjoy writing the dialogue in the, you know, what the characters yeah. say in the book. And a lot of that is, um, I, I used to like playing, you know, Horrible Histories, like stupid deaths. <laughs> yeah. He's very, um, he's a bit like Murden in a way, you know, he's, he's quite full of himself and uh, he likes the misfortunes of others, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Murden's a bit like that and it's quite a sort of authoritative, authoritative voice, but he's not quite as clever as he thinks he is. Right. And, um, well, I, mean, I, I, I picture this, if it was to be a, a film or a TV show down the line that you would you would be in with a shout to actually play Murdin, I reckon. <laughs> I reckon. But then I'd have oh, to get up too early. <laughs> get up in the morning. Um, so <laughs> where, where did the inspiration for this book come from? What gave you the idea or? Uh, well, I, as a kid, I always liked stories about kids who met strange sort of figures. Like, I don't know if you remember Stig of the Dump, which is about a kid yeah. who meets a, a um, Basically, he's, he, he's a uh, caveman, isn't he? Yeah. Uh, you know, and um, I remember E.T. Uh, you probably don't remember this, you're too young, but there used to oh, be... No, I don't remember E.T. Well, he's, not, he's not that he's, young. No, he's <laughs> not that right. me. I just, I just <laughs> look no, not, not for E.T. I mean, for we had this video store in Darlington, where I'm from. Right. And he was called Mr. Video. And one day he said... Um, I've got this video here, uh, and it's from America, and it's a film that's not even out yet in America, and it's called E.T. Right. So imagine what you know about it. I mean, I presume you've both seen E.T., right? Yeah, you know, yeah. One of the most famous films. And, but I was an eight-year-old kid, and, and so I'd never even heard of it. I'd never even, you know, so I hadn't had all the hype, greatest yeah. film of all time, or greatest, one of the greatest family films. So I took it home, and I... And I was just blown away. I was like, wow, you know, little kid meets an alien, becomes friends, you know. And then, of course, it's so sad, you know, when he has to leave. And I was bawling my eyes out and I was laughing hysterically. And that really, um, they're the sort of stories I like. And I wanted to, wanted to tell that. I suppose it's like, you know, in Paddington, you meet a bear, you know. It's, a kid, some, it's really about some kids and a bear and what, how cool it would be to live with a bear. Yeah. And so I went, oh, it'd be pretty cool to live with a wizard, you know, to have a wizard in your shed. It's and that really kind of it's that kind to... of experience, like, you know, an eight year old going to the video shop and get given E. T. before release and that's kind of give you that inspiration. For me, we had a local video shop called Global Video. And when I went when it was shutting down, I got given a film which I thought was like kind of this is the difference. This is why you are who you are, and I, unfortunately, am who I am. Because yeah. my film was Killer Clowns from Outer Space. <laughs> it didn't really inspire me to do anything. Yeah, they were <laughs> right that about, just, about that. That was just your bad luck, isn't it? That's that, it, that, that yeah. That was my E.T. I got E.T. I was, yeah, it was so lucky to get one of them. Because I thought all films were that. I went, oh, this is films. They're all this good. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, sort of 30 years later, you go, <laughs> really only one E.T. <laughs> <laughs> the same guy gave me, oh, this is unrelated, but Airplane. Right, yeah. oh, that's it. And um, again, that was quite, that was a seminal sort of thing for me because I went, I went, oh, I didn't know you were allowed to take the mickey out of, out of disaster films, you know. Yeah, yeah, and there's, yeah. there's a bit of mind horn in that, this film that I did with Julian. Oh, it's brilliant, yeah. I didn't know, you know, you go, oh, you're allowed to look at things and go, they're a bit kind of rubbish, and you're allowed to take the mickey out of them. Yeah. But until I saw Airplane, I had no idea you were, you were allowed to do that. I thought it was, you know, like illegal. 
So, you, so would you say that was like the one film that inspired your sort of uh, writing as far as comedy is concerned? Would you say it was a Airplane then? Yeah, oh, that was definitely when I sort of fell in love with comedy because I couldn't stop laughing. Like, I mean, I, was, I thought I was going to die. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I can remember now, and I must have been only like 10, I think. Yeah. And I was just on, rolling around the floor, like unable to control myself laughing. Thought, thought, did, well, I'll tell you what it is about Airplane as well. It stands the test of time, doesn't it? So even now you can watch it and there are still some absolute hurler lines in there. You know, uh, surely I'm, you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A hospital, it? It's a large building with patients in, but that's not important right now. <laughs> You know, those sort of things, and that, that's, uh, you know, stands the test of time, doesn't it, those sort yeah, actually, of things. Yeah, there's another film, um, Back to Wizard in My Shed, which is what I'm supposed to be talking about, but they, there's a film called Les Visiteurs, it's a French film, right? and it's about two, um, two knights, it's really funny actually if you check it out, two knights, medieval France, and they, they um, the, a witch puts a spell on them and sends them forward in time. Yeah. And so they like arrive in this wood and they don't even know what like a road is you know they see a road and they're like tapping it with a sword and going what is this strange <laughs> yeah. no, you'll be that was a big sorry go on to be one for wizard for wizard in my shed because yeah. i really love that out of time kind of taking that and i and i went back before you know medieval times this is like the dark ages so you know they'll have no windows and no you know <laughs> Um, never mind TV or whatever. So that was a big. So would, would you say like the characters are they just any like with uh, with Rose? Is she based on anyone or inspired by people you know? Or Rose is an interesting one. Probably. Um, I mean, I have a daughter. Yeah. Um, who isn't as old as Rose, but I suppose I just think about when I think about my daughter growing up and about sort of facing the world, you know, and you really feel for kids or I do, I don't know what you, you just go, you, you feel for them at every turn, you know, you go to a, um, you go to see their, I remember watching my daughter in, um, just in an activity play at a school and she yeah. only had one line, but I was sat in the audience nearly dying, like with, I was, I was like, come on, you know, nervous for her. She yeah. was sort of fine, but that's why I feel with Rose. I, I like want to look after her and go, it's okay, you're going to be yeah. all right. It you know, doesn't matter if the kids at school laugh at you, you know, you stay true to yourself and, you know, keep faith in yourself and you'll be all right. So, so I suppose if that's anyone, it, it's probably my feeling towards my daughter, I guess. Yeah. yeah. I, was, um, I was explaining to my deputy head today, who's like in charge of reading. Obviously, we both work in separate schools. But I was telling my deputy head today, obviously she knows who you are. She's a massive Horrible Histories fan and, and uh, obviously your other work. And I was saying that we were interviewing you about your new children's book and she said, oh, what's, what's it called? And I said, oh, it's called The Wizard in My Shed. And honestly, it was like I told her that she'd won. She's got a winning ticket. She was got so excited. So I'm pretty sure you'll have a nice order coming in from my school. There's no, <laughs> there's no doubt about ah, that. Brilliant. Yeah, good to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I'm like that with my kids. I, I fear for them. I, I, uh, I talk about it quite a lot when, when I do my work with schools, just saying, I think for this generation especially, it is so much harder than what it was like when we were kids. You know, I think so, yeah. The pressures from social media and the expectations yeah. in, in school a lot of the time. Well, there's, um, there's a lot of that in the, in the book, you know. I, um, the, 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 these three bullies um called the cats and they um they sort of video rose's terrible audition and put it on youtube and yeah yeah and of course that's what i like about i mean really murdin is like a father figure like murdin's like me and my daughter you know yeah or, or, I, or how i imagine it'll be when she's a bit older because <laughs> i think all dads are all people who are i think everyone feels a bit out of time as well like even you know, not so long ago, I thought, oh, I'm young and I know what YouTube is and I know what Twitter is and I know what, and now it's something else, you know, TikTok or, or whatever. <laughs> yeah. 
you always feel a bit left behind as a as a parent or as a grown up. But I think the kids feel that way as well, slightly. You know, I think the kids feel like, and as well, they've got this these they've got to live up to these expectations. People yeah. only put their good selves on. You know, when we were at, when we were at school, there was not not none of that stuff. No. You know, you basically put your clothes on to go to school, and that was the best you'd get. <laughs> <laughs> not, that was your display picture. <laughs> that was your new display picture, a haircut. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, haircut was about as, 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 uh, as much as you could do. Yeah. And I think there's a pressure to be, uh, the, you know, and to That's get cool. likes. And, you know, even my daughter, who's six, watches, you know, we let her on YouTube sometimes, but she's always like, I've got to like this and I've got to press like and I've got to recommend and all this. And you go, no, you don't. You don't have to no, get involved. It's, 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 that's what they're all about. Getting yeah, it's, it's a it's scary, very strange. scary world. If you actually see what they're watching on YouTube as well, the, the majority of the time, it's like them watching, people watching, people watching yeah. someone yeah. play something. It's just absolutely... Yeah, my, I made the mistake of letting my boys discover Minecraft over lockdown. And that was, yeah. uh, and I was quite a fan of Minecraft because it's, it's quite a creative sort of game in that they can build and stuff. But they've now got to the point where they're not as interested in actually playing Minecraft. It's watching videos on YouTube of Americans talking through <laughs> playing Minecraft. Yeah. It's, that, it's unbelievable. Honestly, it's, it's, uh, it's very bizarre. I don't actually understand that. In any way, yeah. shape, or form. No, no. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, a couple more questions on the book then. So, what uh, compared to obviously all the other sort of writing that you've you've done before? How would you compare this? Did you find it easier, harder? Did you enjoy it more? What would you say? Um, I tell you what, it is. I did enjoy it more probably. Um, I'll tell you what it is. It's like when you write a, a screenplay you know, take sort of Paddington 2, for example, you know, and you go, you, you hand it over to a director and then the, direct, it's the, the director from then on sort of calls the shots, you know, and, yeah. and he'll usually will, will cast it and, you've got the, and then you've got the actors who come in and some of them might um, change things you do or might not be how you imagined it. And then yeah. you've got a set designer and you've got a costume designer and you've got, you know, and then you've got the editing process and you're not really involved in that. Whereas a book is really a way of going, um, you know, I'm the writer, but I'm also the director. I'm, I do the scenery, I do the set design, I do the costumes, <laughs> you know, there's no one can go, oh, you can't have a chandelier in that room. <laughs> you know, on, the, on a film, you go, no, you can't have that, mate. It's too expensive. <laughs> <laughs> you've got have, you know, you've got to have a lamp. You can have a lamp yeah. in the corner and that's it. Whereas when you write a book, you, you really have the freedom to... I, I, I like to see it as you sort of... You're making a film for people to play in their heads yeah, as yeah. they read. <laughs> so, they, say that they always say the book's better than the film. It was funny. Yeah, they, and I think it's because it plays to your imagination. And yeah. I think you always imagine things much better than... Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, that's great. I had it with the... Apart, uh, from in, uh, apart from in Killer Clowns, <laughs> yeah. Killer clowns from outer space. <laughs> you should have read that the book. Cannot, that cannot be beaten. But I had it with my wife and Twilight. My wife made me watch one of the Twilight films a while ago. And um, she'd read all the books and loved the books. And then I was forced to sit through this film. And I didn't really pay much attention to it. I was sort of on my phone or whatever. And then at the end of it, I turned to my wife and I was like, did you enjoy that? And she sort of was like a bit, mm, not really, you know, and I thought she'd love it. And I was like, wow, what's the matter? And she was like, He's not my Edward, and I was just like, yeah, like, yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. Who she pictured as as her Edward, uh, she thought it was a bit more, you know, masculine, muscular, yeah. <laughs> you know, a bit more like me, <laughs> a bit more round. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's um, it's like people have said, uh, oh, what about someone like you know, like for Murdin, like Benedict Cumberbatch or someone would be good, and yeah, and I, oh yeah, it would be, but then some people don't like Benedict Cumberbatch, you know, and they go, oh, I don't I like him. Like 
it's funny you should say that because we had a conversation on the on a pod, on the podcast once about who would play us in a Hollywood film. I mean, I doubt we'll ever get there. A biopic. Yeah, a biopic. And I said Benedict Cumberbatch would be perfect for him. And he hated yeah, it. Because I said Chris Pratt for me because we're both quite chunky and funny. And Benedict Cumberbatch. <laughs> I, think you, I think you did well out of that. Yeah, I <laughs> I he just argues till I, till I agree, till I stop, stop talking. It was, but it was like, you know, we're, what are you, 34, 35? 35, yeah. So he's 35, I'm 31, and we were sat there going, no, I'm him, I'm him. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, who would you cast if you had to, if you had to cast it? Who would you, who would your murder be? Um... I seem to, I mean, actually, I have thought Benedict Cumberbatch probably would be quite good. They need someone with a lot of sort of authority, you know. Um, I would have loved, like, Daniel Day-Lewis in his heyday. Yeah, He's yeah. probably old now. Uh, someone with a lot of authority, and the more sort of serious they are, the better in a way. Yeah. I mean, yeah. for me, I think because I know you, I just picked you doing it. Right, yeah. Well, hey, listen, I, I, I'll, I'll, um, I'll put my hat in the ring. <laughs> you, could yeah. be the, you could be the writer, the director, the costume designer, and the main star. Well, I'll we'll actually do it for real, yeah. But, but how would you feel if, like, let's that. imagine the scenario, it got greenlit to be a film, you then sort of adapt the screenplay, it goes to a director, and then they, you, don't, you go for the casting and you don't get it. <laughs> what would you do then? <laughs> well, that, yeah, well, that, that does happen. Really? Yeah. Oh. I've known that happen. <laughs> I feel like he's <laughs> feel just like unlocked the bad memory there. <laughs> I'll just uh, put my foot in it, haven't I? Um, so I, I never thought of it like that. I suppose with, with, with writing a screenplay then, yeah? You, once you've done the, the, the script. So, you know, with the likes of Paddington, would you say it was starkly different to the script you wrote or there was just minor little differences that... Uh, yeah, I think... It, Pennington's interesting because it, I, because I write with the director, so right. we're in the room all the time together. And so he'll show me things, you know, and we'll talk about casting and he'll show me like, oh, this is where we think we're going to do the, you know, or like St. Paul's Cathedral, you know, and we were lucky in Pennington too because we've got, we've got quite iconic kind of places to go and film in and so that's an interesting one. Although, and, and we did get our cast for that. Like we, Hugh Grant, we wrote, his character was called Hugh Grant in the script. Him, <laughs> him. Amazing. Um, I am. Uh, offended. Like the, the Paddington films are absolutely amazing. And I've seen both of them. And Paddington too, I'm not just saying, is, is you know, Hugh Grant in that as well, it is amazing. But I had no idea that, he, that the bear was from Peru. I only found that out about a week ago. You know, because of the new show it goes, he came from Peru to be with me and you. I was like, he came from where? <laughs> this is what I have to deal with you. Where did you think he was from? London. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's a good point, because he is very British. He, but he yeah, learned that's what I mean. I was it. confused. Yeah. I mean, in the first film at the beginning, it, it's because his Aunt Lucy loves London and... I had, so he learned it off records of, you know, people speaking English in a very sort of posh way. So I was probably really getting extra cheese on my matches. <laughs> yeah. So, um, is it, I mean, what would you say Stig of the Dump was your favourite book as a child? Or was there any other books you read as a youngster that sort of inspired this one? Um, or I read, other um, I mean, Roald Dahl, I read a lot of. I liked um, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and Danny Champion of the World. Yeah. Um, and, um, but I read quite, like, there's these books that I was obsessed with that I don't think you can get anymore, um, called Sherlock Hound. All right. And it was, uh, so hound as in dog, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, Sherlock, Sherlock Hound was a, um, a dog, obviously. I think he was a basset hound. And his, and, uh, Watson was a Scottish terrier. Yeah, and everyone in it was dogs, and um, <laughs> I, there was about twelve of them, and I read them all. You know, I, I loved them, but I've tried to get them. These you can't get them anymore. No, I, I don't even remember what I loved about them. They were just really funny, 
yeah. and they were very simple sort of um uh mystery sort of tales you know yeah so i've always liked slightly strange sort of creatures strange tales and funny and funny um funny books you know and i think that's what Roll down on, on a social media campaign to try and find them. I'm sure someone has them in a in a Still account, yeah. Because I, I listened to a podcast recently, uh, a football one, and they were talking about Steve Bruce, you know, the Newcastle manager. He wrote yeah. a series of books about a footballer who was also a detective and sort yeah. of had to solve crimes. And you can't get because I think once it was shared on one of these podcasts, it went, but you could not get a copy of it. It was like gold that you couldn't get hold of it, and uh, apparently it's it, awful. Still, awful. I know all about this because um, because I'm I'm a uh, I'm a Newcastle fan, and then oh yeah, uh, and Jim Howick, who's on um, um, Horrible Histories with me, is a he's a Spurs fan, and we talk about football quite a lot. And me and Jim were just in between takes one day, and we were just googling stuff, yeah. and then. Uh, about football and Steve Bruce's novels came up and went, hey, look, Steve Bruce has done some... <laughs> but you should see the... Have you, have you seen the covers of them? There's like one's called Striker. Yeah, yeah. It's got the Striker on a pitch with a knife in it. <laughs> <laughs> now, and a big crowd in it. I guess someone's got to have seen that happening. <laughs> uh, I'm surprised, yeah. Maybe, Maybe that might that inspire your next book. Them Sherlock Hound books will be in a teacher somewhere's yeah, I reckon so. classroom cupboard. Because yeah. you find stuff in there from... The from, cupboard behind, behind the old TV on yeah, the wheels. The exactly, wheel, yeah. TV. Yeah. Um, so, obviously, you said there that Murdin is banished for bad behaviour. What was the baddest thing you ever did when you were at school, Simon? Let's get down to nitty-gritty. Oh, God. I mean, I, I did see that question in there. Uh... Well, um... <laughs> it was a strange school for me because my primary school was at a, in, in the village that I lived in, which is a very small village. And it's interesting because my daughter, my, my mum brought my daughter a load of photographs down of, of my school. Um, uh, oh, well, just of me as a kid. And, and Eve was looking through them. And she found one of me and um, about sort of, 18 other kids and she went dada your your class was so small <laughs> and my mum went that was his old school <laughs> <laughs> why were you the best in your year group when there's only two of you <laughs> yeah there was about four of us i think but wow. it was really, it's really odd i mean i find that strange with my eve going to school and there's like 32 kids in a in the class and i go yeah. what how on earth do you well how do you teach anything in the yeah. class that size and how do you how do you learn anything it's so must be so difficult for teachers but it, it, the challenges um, come in different ways as well because if you're at a very very small school it's there's the challenges in that you might have a small class but it was likely you would have been in a class with other year groups as well so yeah, yeah. so you might have a class of you know 18 but the teacher yeah. has to somehow teach year six and ones, yeah year one in the same time so it but um, because there was different sort of, I mean, this is the worst thing I could think of that I did. Um, I used to have a couple of the younger kids um, were like, I used to call them my royal steps. So <laughs> at break time, I'd be sitting on my chair and I'd go, royal steps, and these kids would go and lie on the floor and I'd step on them to get off my chair. And I was only about six. I think that's pretty bad, actually. Yeah, I mean, it's good. I'm sure and they'll be telling everyone that we used to be royal steps for Simon Farnaby. <laughs> I hope so. I mean, <laughs> but when I thought of that, yeah, one of them would kneel, one of them would be on the hands and knees, the other one would be laid down. So it was like two tears. <laughs> Did on you on walk on him? Yeah, I walked on him, yeah. And then, and then when I came back, I'd go royal steps and they'd get down and then I'd climb up. <laughs> I love how you just said it. Royal steps, they could have been playing their own game. Oh, it's our time. I was going to say, who inspired the bullies in the book, but... Uh, well, I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, but also, it's slightly like Murdin. That's the sort of thing that Murdin would, would do or would like to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The royal steps. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, that's like one of those... Uh, 
you know, uh, folklore stories you hear from school. Like, you know, when you start secondary school, we used to have Sprog Bashing Day, didn't sprog we? Sprog Bashing Day, And if yeah. there was a Friday the 13th then you were a year seven, you couldn't go in the toilets because you'd get your head flushed down the toilet. And you'd hear these rumours of children who never survived Sprog Bashing Day. That sounds like another one. Yeah, but there is, there is the one, um, it was like the classic where you say to someone like, oh, loser says what? And then they go, what? And you go, <laughs> loser. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You have um so where where are you where are you from? We're Manchester, we're based in Manchester. Manchester right. Yeah. Do you have do you have a thing called Mischief Night, which is the night before bonfire night, so on the fourth of November. Right. So no, yeah, so yeah, yeah, bonfire night on the fifth, but the night before, where in the northeast or where I was maybe just in the village I was from. Yeah. They had mischief night. And you would go and do like knock on doors and run away and like egging and stuff. Bad stuff that on mischief night. Yeah, that yeah, just, it was like egging and stuff, egg, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah. Toilet paper. I remember we we paper. a couple a couple of like me and my friends went to a girl's house who was in our year and one of our mates had just been finished by her, so it was a bit of a revenge mission, and uh, we egged a house and then set off running, but we forgot that the dad was like a former athlete <laughs> the dad you opened the door fun. and caught our slowest mate <laughs> we were all gone and my, my slowest mate who'd obviously had a few too many hamburgers it was me so don't egg like daily thompson's house <laughs> exactly yeah. <laughs> yeah get a javelin to the back yeah um so would you say you enjoyed school or you know because obviously people, you know, you either, uh, I think you come out of school, you either love it or hate it. Would you say? Yeah, it was like I, did a <laughs> I, mean, I think I did on the whole. Um, yeah. yeah, I think I did. It was strange that my school, primary school was very small, so I sort of loved that. And then I went to secondary school, which was massive. Yeah. And that was a bit of a, then, then I became, I wasn't the sort of, I wasn't the bully anymore. I was the bullied. What, were, you, were you, have you gone from the king? Were you a royal step? <laughs> I, I, I didn't quite reach the depths of royal step, but I wasn't far off. Ro royal punch bag, more like. <laughs> yeah. um, so when you were at school, I mean, going off your career, uh, well, I would s take a stab at sort of saying that uh, English and history would have been your favourite subjects when you were at school. Uh, in English was, yeah. 100%. People often think this, yeah, history... I, I, when I was a kid, I, I wasn't that interested in it, but I do think it was because it was taught in a very dry sort of yeah. way. And um, I think now, now I think people, um, I think teachers maybe are better at getting kids interested. I just used to go, why should I, why am I interested in what happened ages ago? Yeah. I want to know if, you know, Joanna Bradshaw wants to go out with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have no interest in, in the past yeah and really it was it was later on like that i that i got into it probably at university and and i became interested in history and maybe what it meant and you know uh, how, how we all got here but yeah. at school no and people are often surprised by it but i didn't i wasn't i wasn't into it at all um, so what was it with with english then being was that your favorite subject english oh definitely yeah yeah and in fact, was it? my only subject, I was only really interested in, in English language and literature. And um, yeah. I, was just, it the I just, I just, was it the content? You are? Would you say it was the teacher or the teachers you had or was it the yeah, Actually, the teacher I had, um, I remember Miss Rushton, she was called, uh, she was amazing. And, um, and then I had a really good one at A-level, Mr. Trees. I was very lucky and they were, they, they really inspired me and it gave me, always found new books for me to enjoy. And yeah, um, I always liked books with a sort of, you know, with, with humor in them. And I remember that my teacher A-level giving me stuff from America, like beat poets and like Charles Bukowski and these very quite, quite avant-garde figures. And, but they were really funny and did sort of um, stuff that no one else was doing. So, yeah. I just found it endlessly interesting and um, unlike history. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what were your history teachers like? Were they just, just drive? 
just no, I can't remember them. I think I was so I think I just used to switch off. Yeah. Think about Joanna Bradshaw. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, and then, like, of all the subjects you had to do at school, which was what, the one that you hated the most? Oh, God. Uh, probably, I think we had this thing called CDT. Oh, yeah. No, no, craft design technology. Yeah. And that was even worse than history. But what, drawing lines? <laughs> Oh, we had a, yeah, it's just DT now, isn't yeah, it? They, they must have got rid of the C, dropped the C. The craft. Yeah, they dropped the, the C bomb. That was the only interesting bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we had a, our DT teacher was called Mr. Wood. I mean, you can't get better than that. I mean, you can't yeah, write that sort of stuff. Yeah. And then he got replaced by a guy called David Thwaite. And once we realised his initials were DT, it was game <laughs> over. <laughs> yeah, the DT. We had a Mr. Wood as well, a science teacher. But he looked like Skeletor. Do you remember from He Man? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we were pretty cruel. <laughs> My physics teacher, I, we, we, he was quite sort of weak. And we, um, I won't name him, but I think we really, we nearly forced him to a nervous breakdown because, you know, those classrooms and you'd let the gas off and do something, yeah. and, you know, bunts and burners. And, yeah, you know, yeah. And he was so fed up with us. I remember one day he just sat. He just gave up trying to control us and he just sat with his head in his hand for like about 20 minutes. And then we went, oh, great. He's given up teaching. And we were just laughing around. So we were all making noise and chatting and he was just like this. Oh, and no. now I feel so sorry for that guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Adam, Adam was renowned for that. You know, he was, he was the one. Oh, really? He, he, he got a few teachers on deep. Yeah, there. I mean, yeah, it was, it was difficult. It was, you know, because when you're that age and you're with like your mates and something like we had a teacher called Mr. Allcock and then oh, someone God. shouted, uh, all cut no balls. <laughs> and that was it. I was done. I, he couldn't teach me anything after that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've got, um, there's a teacher in Murden, Rose's teacher. It's called Mr. Watson, yeah. but you call him uh, Mr. One Tone. And that was <laughs> because he talks like, uh, you know, um, yeah. we're going to Stonehenge for a historical, it's going to be fascinating. <laughs> and then that's probably why I got my history. He was, my, he was one of my teachers, you see. Yeah, yeah. He would yeah. do history. So actually, I've just remembered that's, I've just remembered who my history teacher was. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to. There we go. If you there, don't yeah. go, you know, if you don't go, hey, this is really exciting, you just go, you know, the, um, William the Conqueror led his army into Hastings. It took them three hours to cross the channel in yeah. a boat made of what you just go, oh my God. <laughs> well, I just think that's, that's probably the reason why I think Horrible Histories was just such a, because Horrible Histories for me is just elite, elite kids TV. I don't think you can get better. I'm, I'm honestly saying that. I was saying before about my kids and some of the garbage they watch. Um, and you know, our dad used to be the same with what we used to watch, I and have, you know, yeah. uh, Keenan yeah. and Kyle or whatever it yeah. was that we were watching. But it was getting, getting something that will teach you, um, it teaches kids by stealth, you know, it's a yeah, yeah. show and with funny characters. And then you just sneak in a bit of, but I would, I would have loved to have had it when I was a kid and it would have been, it would have transformed our viewed history completely. Because oh, absolutely. You know, history is like people think, they're just like us, they're just humans, and they might have spoken a little bit differently, but that was always our thing, is we'd go, you play William the Conqueror, but do him like a bank manager, you know? <laughs> he's just like anyone else, you know, he's just a human being with a voice, and you know. And I think um, once you do that, you go, oh, they were just like us, they just lived in a different time. Yeah. And, um, and it is that's really sort of where I was going with Murdin and to go, you know, we're all just human beings, you know, we always, you know, we, we, we learn lessons from the past and try and all get on in the future, but we're all sort of one, we're all one, you know. Yeah, yeah. But I would say, I mean, uh, on behalf of the, I'm going to speak on behalf of the teaching profession, but I think that as that TV show, Horrible Histories, really did inject enthusiasm back into that subject, just the way it was done and, and, I mean, I will watch it still now, and, and I'll, 
there's parts of it that are so funny. And I think what's great about it as well is it it's there's bits in it that adult, you know, it's more, you know, there's bits that obviously the kids and then there's another layer for, for adults, which is what makes watching TV when there's those sort of little things that you think, yeah, the kids don't get that, but I I've I've got that. Yeah, one. no, there's a lot, there's a lot in it for adults, and we get a lot of adult adult viewers, you know, and um, yeah. adult fans and, and and it is for, you know, again, it is for I, I try and it's like with Murdin, like that. It's definitely not. Um, it's pitched at sort of I think eight, eight plus, you know. Yeah. Or if you read, you'll enjoy it. But really, uh, there's quite a lot of adult things in there. It's just what you know, did it in Paddington Two, and um, you know, and in Horrible Histories, and you just try and put things in front of. As long as, long as the kids are, are interested and entertained, and a, a kid doesn't mind if a joke goes over their head, no, you no, know, for no. a couple of seconds, and. And it makes their dad laugh, and they go, "What do you laugh about that for?" And go, yeah. I'm not, yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I get yeah, that all the time. What's funny about that? What does that mean? Yeah, that's, um, but that's all part of it, and, and kids like that as well. They like, they like that they've got things, jokes to get. Yeah. The next time they watch it. And, Absolutely. You know, so I'm going to put you on the spot here now. Then, so of all the different periods that you know you're covering horrible histories, which would you say is your favourite? Your, your favourite period in history that you absolutely love. Well, funnily enough, I, I used to like playing the cavemen. Yeah. Because <laughs> they were always, um, well, you didn't have to remember so many lines. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't as hard, it was quite easy to do. Yeah. But also, um, uh, you know, but also we'd play cavemen that sort of talked like TV presenters. You know, go, hello, welcome to the Stone Age. Uh, I'm here today teaching you how to cook an egg. <laughs> you know, and it'd be, they were just always because we all looked so stupid, and we'd we'd spent three hours in makeup, you know, and, and there were always good days on set when we were cavemen, and um, uh, I don't know for some reason we always had good a good laugh when we were. Yeah, I think that's another thing with that with that show is, and and obviously you've gone on to do other projects as well. Is you just get a real good sense of. Uh, how close you are as a group and how much you must get on, at, you know, off the screen as well. It seems like it was a real sort of team that got on with each other. A bit like a staff in a school, really, sort of when, when things gel and when things come together, magic happens, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. It was, we, we all got on really well and wanted to keep working with each other and, and just finding another, you know, we did Yonderland for Sky and then we did Ghosts for... Um, we did a film called Bill as well, which is, I don't know if you've yeah, seen, about Shakespeare and that sort of semi-educational as well. And we yeah, really yeah. love doing that. And um, uh, we will continue to work together because we all get on well and we know what, we can make each other laugh and, you know, the people watching laugh, which is... Which yeah, is yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I was thinking the other day about, I mean, there'll come a time where they probably bring something like Horrible Histories back whether it be like 50 years, 100 years, what do you reckon it'd be like if you had to do sketches on this period of time now? Because I found, <laughs> I've sort of said in a, a few of my training sessions with teachers that I sometimes feel that in, you know, 200 years, if we're still around in 200 years, they'll look back at this period in history and sort of deem it the worst time. <laughs> everything that's happened before that we just don't learn from sort of thing yeah. so you know what do you reckon it'd be called I was thinking today what do you reckon a pit, if you, so you got like terrible Tudors uh, rotten Romans nasty noughties <laughs> nasty noughties yeah. Uh, yeah miserable millennials the boring twenties <laughs> yeah. the boring twenties I don't know. Yes, it's very. It's a good question. Uh, it's a strange one because, in in some ways, it's a good time to be alive because you're not like life expectancy is high and because yeah. of medicine, and you're not getting killed in wars and stuff. You know, like there's not actually, but it's just sort of politically everything seems to be all over the place and mm -hmm. and. Um, and in, in a way that they didn't seem to be like 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah. You don't feel like you can trust anyone who's in charge, really. But, but um, so you're right. I don't know what they'll make of it. And I, and I, but 
but the thing is that it's, it, it, you can, it's very hard to judge. Um, somebody said comedy is um, tragedy plus time. Yeah. Right? So you got to go, if it's bad now, we can't see it yet. We can't see what's funny about it till t- 10, 20 years in the future. And then we'll go, oh, yeah, now I get that. You know, you know. That's so true. Wasn't yeah. Boris Johnson funny? <laughs> <laughs> it didn't seem like it at the time. Whereas now at the minute, yeah, somebody is tragedy plus time. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, that's so true. It's, that's, it like my ex, that's like my ex-girlfriend. I mean, I've said a story on the podcast where I was dumped in the middle of Pizza Hut. And it was like, the w- <laughs> stop it. It was like the worst moment of my life. And I was crying and, and just being like, you'll regret this. And then, um, like. You know, it's the funniest. <laughs> yeah. now, now it's one of my funniest stories. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. you got to give it a bit of time and then you go, yeah, you, you can, can sort of take it apart and go find out what was going on. Yeah. That's it, yeah. I hope, I reckon, yeah, it'll be like that. In a few years, we'll look back and we'll be like, what, what were we doing? What was, what was <laughs> that? What was 2020? Um, I, I didn't realise, by the way, that you had a, uh, a, a part in Rogue One, Star Wars. Yeah, I had one line, which was... Um, but what we a line. Have long. <laughs> Neither did I in that film. <laughs> How was that as an experience? I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, I was actually writing uh, Paddington Two at the time, and I got a call saying, "Do you want to? Do you want to spend two days? No, three days on Star Wars?" And I went, "Well, yeah." <laughs> and went, I asked my Paul, uh, my writing, who I was writing with, I said, um, can I take two days off? And he went, no. <laughs> and I said, it's for Star Wars. And then he went, okay, you can go. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was good fun. Yeah. I mean, I knew it was going to be just a small part, but I had mates actually who, so there was about 20 of us and we were all, we all had to go in this X wing. Yeah. And against all this screen, all these screens, you know, and it was, and it was, uh, it was a great experience. And they fed these lines into our ears and we said these lines. And then it, so I said about sort of 40 lines. Yeah. And then they just would go back and the director would go back and pick over who said what line's the best. And I, I know a few people who got, who didn't make it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it killed off before they even got to the screen. So at least I made it onto the screen. Yeah, yeah. They sound like royal steps to me. <laughs> they were the royal steps, yeah. <laughs> so, um... You mentioned your daughter before. How has is, how is the whole home learning been? Um, do you, have, you, have you sort of popped out any of the costumes from Horrible Histories to do a, a lesson with your daughter? It's been hard. It's really hard, isn't it? Um, yeah. we, um, we did quite a bit of sort of homeschooling, but I think like everyone else, there comes a point where your kids don't want you to be teachers, you know. <laughs> I mean, it must be hard for you guys because you are you know, you oh, teach as well. But um, I, I had my daughter the other day to turn around and just before she went back to school and I said to her, I said, are you looking forward to school? She was like, yeah. I said, uh, you're not going to be sad that dad's not your teacher anymore. And she turned around to me and she went, well, dad, I was thinking about this. I just don't understand I have so many followers online when you're a rubbish teacher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what so, daughters are. That's what they're there for. Yeah. Put holes in you and keep your feet on <laughs> Absolutely. And how um, how's she found going back to school? How's the transition? Uh, she's been good, actually. She's just got tired. She's been she's only been two weeks in. Yeah. And um, this morning she went. I don't want to go to school. I went. Why? And she went. I'm really tired. Yeah. <laughs> that awesome. they, 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 they're off so long, and they it's yeah. so exhausting for them. To get, you know. Did you hit her with the textbook, uh, the textbook parent reply of tired? You don't know the meaning of the word. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I did. I went. Well, this doesn't make any difference. You're going to school anyway. <laughs> you kind of be off, and I went. No, tired is not. I'm not going to write. I'm not going to ring in and say she's not coming in. She's tired. <laughs> uh, so yeah, yeah told you, Scott. I mean, we. I mean, I'm very passionate about education, and I have my sort of views. On, on an education. So from what you know, I don't know how much you know about our education system. If you were put into the position of uh, ed, ed secretary, educational secretary, which 
by the way, I would gladly accept anyone, but who's there now? You know, what is there anything that you would change about education from sort of what you've done and and, and um, you've done? I would have um, I would have less sort of t everything seems to be very target based at the moment, and yeah, the, if they're gonna if they're gonna not have any money or not put any money in the schools, then they can't expect teachers to hit all these targets. So it's it pressures all around when there when there's no money. So there'd be that. I mean, that's a slightly depressing one. But <laughs> on the other hand, I would I would go. Um, I would teach story in school. I would teach kids how to tell stories. Yeah, I, I do this with my daughter, and I go. Um, we have story school, and we'd be in the back, and I go. You know what? What's rule number one? And she go character. Rule number two. What do they want? Rule number three. What's in their way? And then yeah. have a villain, and then have a happy ending. And that's it. So she gets the little toys, and you know she goes. My character's a dinosaur. He wants to win a singing competition what's in his way he's terrible at it and then those building blocks kids can tell stories because I, rem I remember you sort of have to learn to do it when i was a kid and my daughter does this as well she doesn't like bad things to happen to characters so she, she'll write a story and it's about a little girl called daisy who has a really lovely life and goes on holiday and and then it's a happy ending. And I go, darling, nothing's happened. She go, I don't want anything to happen because I love my little girl. Yeah. And like, just, just, just to get kids and go, listen, if you're going to tell a story, you got to put your character through hell, you know, yeah. or like, or like that's your, um, uh, someone once said it simply went, uh, um, the simplest way to tell a story is put a man up a tree, throw sticks at the man, bring the man back down the tree. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> get your character, put them through hell and then, and then give them a happy ending. Or like, yeah. or like make it, you know, just give, it, give your character a little journey. And there's little simple things that I would go in, probably in part of English or very early on just to go, here are the building blocks, very simple of, of storytelling. Yeah. And uh, I think kids will get a lot out of it. Do you and it's not taught at all. At all. No, do you know what? You're spot on there because, um, you know, the curriculum that we teach at the minute, at primary especially, there is, uh, obviously, you've got your SATs at the end of year six. And one of the SATs that the children have to uh, sit is the SPAG test, which is spelling, punctuation and grammar. So what I noticed, and I, I talk about this quite a lot, is that it, it, it makes, not, not sort of makes teachers, because, you know, teachers wouldn't choose to do it, but because you've got to pass this test, so much of your English now is about the technical side of writing and knowing yeah. what a, a fronted adverbial is. I was actually thinking of doing this as a little game of like throwing these terms at you who is, you know, as a writer, really accomplished. A with published the, author. A yeah. published author. Just to sort of show how ridiculous some of these terms are. So, you know, a modal verb, uh, the yeah. active and passive voice. Things you would know how to use because you know, it was taught through sort of osmosis of being exposed to texts and stories. That's what I mean, it's targets and it's, I don't know any of those things and I've done it with my daughter, you know, like, um, you know, phonemes and, and um, I mean, I, I did a bit of sort of, um, um, I did a bit of uh, phonetics at yeah. drama school with accents where they're actually quite useful, but not, I really found it, some of the stuff she was doing was far too complicated. Yeah. And if they just spend that time getting kids to enjoy books and to enjoy stories and, or, or like Julian Barrett, who I wrote Mind On With, can't yeah. even spell. He can't even write. <laughs> barely use a typewriter. Um, but he's brilliant. He's a really funny, amazing at story, brilliant, you know, at everything. But if you were to judge him on his, either his handwriting or even his, you know, send me a, uh, uh, a, a document he's done on his computer that makes no sense. You know? <laughs> and, that, and that's got spell check and that's got, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah. nowadays they do it all for you, you know. Um, yeah. So really, and it's not that important. What's important it's is what storytelling. Story is thing. Yeah. As, as you do with the, with the book, it's, that it's stories are what connects us as a, as a society, as a people, you know, and uh, that's been since Stone Age stories. 
you know, yeah. that's what's, what's helped us move forward. So absolutely, really, uh, I completely agree with you there. So um, we do have, like, normally on our on our podcast, we have sort of features and sort of uh, things we'll talk about, the quirky sort of unusual things. So I might just throw a few of these, a few of these at you, and if there's anything that springs to mind, feel free to share. So one of the features we have are sort of random things that you only find in school. So you know things that you will have probably never seen anywhere else in the world apart from when you were at primary school. Any examples jump out to you? Of, uh, <laughs> of what are you going to read? What? Where well, are they? What do you just, mean? Just, can you think of anything that we like oh, that we used to? Or we've oh, I about? see. Right, things, things you only, things you only get in. Um, yeah, so you know, like the wooden benches in assembly. Well, in a class of four, probably empty chairs. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know. Yeah, royal steps. You don't get many of them. <laughs> the there school. we go. Uh, I might try that. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I remember plimsolls. I've never seen plimsolls since school. Yeah. I mean, they are an established footwear. Yeah. We don't, black I mean, you know what, don't really get them that much in school now. Really, they're they're they? very slippy. Yeah. Like, I find that the, the grip on... Are we talking about PE pumps? Yeah, yeah. What's that word that Simon Plimsolls. used? Plim, plimsolls, we call them. I've <laughs> never heard that word in my life. Yeah, we say educational podcast mainly because Adam learns something new every week. There you go. <laughs> word of the week for Adam, plimsolls. Um, yeah, well, other things like pointless things you find in schools. So we could very quickly talk, well, we've already sort of mentioned all the uh, terms that children are forced to remember for the SPAG test. Yeah. That horrendous. sacrifices the sort of... Uh, um, the pointless thing as well, I think the pointless thing is the fire drill being up on the wall in small writing. I think that's pointless oh, everywhere. Yeah, yeah. If there's a fire, you get out. It's simple. It should just say, get out. You hear fire, get out. Yeah. Uh, and then right, you always like... have to line up. You have to go and line up in, 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 uh, in a specific place in single file. Yeah. Going, look, how important is it that we all line up in straight <laughs> lines in the playground? Like a can we just get as far away as we can? Absolutely. Is that because you weren't next to that girl that you liked? <laughs> I know, yeah. Do you want a Bradshaw? Yeah. I hope she's not listening to this. I was going to say, I bet she's loving this. I bet she's like, woo! <laughs> um, we also have a feature, obviously, during these times. We had a feature called uh, COVID of the Week. So it was sort of anyone that was in the news for doing something ridiculous, crazy uh during the pandemic is anything that you've seen recently that you just thought you know face palm moment for why is that why why would you do that during these very very difficult times it is an odd one because i don't notice I, i've heard this term covid it's now i don't really notice it because um because i say we my wife and daughter and i got it so early on and, and got over it yeah um, and then so, you know, because people go, isn't it awful when someone runs past you and they're out running or someone's, you know, not got their mask on and I go, oh, I don't know. It's because I'm not that worried. About, like, I'm lucky enough to be not. Yeah, yeah. About it, like a lot of people are totally justifiably. Yeah. So I probably don't notice. So that means that I'm the COVID. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first time. Sure that is me. It's acceptance. I've accepted it. Yeah. Um, I mean, my, my, not that my mum's a COVID it, but my mum always, I think parents are quite funny in this because they are, my parents are both in their 70s and vulnerable, but still treat it like it's the biggest nuisance. <laughs> like, oh God, I've got to wear a bloody mask when I go <laughs> to the bloody shop. Stupid <laughs> bloody thing. <laughs> and I forgot it the other day and they wouldn't let me in. <laughs> you know, it's all this. So, and then my mum always says, well, when, when all this nonsense is over, then um, we'll come and see you. Yeah. Nonsense, you know. <laughs> well, it's not nonsense. Yeah, it's a load of bloody rubbish. <laughs> Have you done that thing where, um, you know, you're speaking to more people because it's obviously been locked down and stuff and 
you've, if, if, you know, when this nonsense ends, you've got so many plans because you say to people, we should, we should meet up more, we should catch up yeah, more. Yeah. <laughs> well, there was a time when, in the, in the harshest bit of lockdown, when I was too busy with doing, I had a Zoom every night, I had a quiz with my wife's family, I had a quiz with my family, I had a, everyone was so, oh, we've got to, let's do a regular thing. And then you'd have a mate's night and then, you go bloody oh god i need to, i need a break from zoom <laughs> a break i was that. desperate to keep connected and then you did it for a week to bloody quiz i was like ah oh, sick of these quizzes is this what this is what made the book that the, the zoom the the sickness that just uh fed up of doing the zoom quizzes led to this book being written well, <laughs> yeah, like, um, like that, yeah just going back to this because we can wrap it up in a second. Do you have a particular sort of routine when it comes to writing? Because I watched the video recently with, uh, it's like an old clip of Roald Dahl. And he, he was talking through his process of how he, how he wrote his books. And it was interesting because he has his house and then he just used to go to this little shed, which I'm thinking, wizarding my shed. And he just used to sit there. And, and I was thinking, did he become this author? Once he had kids, he's <laughs> thinking, right, <laughs> how can I get a break away from the right, kids? Right, go and write in the shed. Yeah, I'll go and write in the shed. Yeah, quite possibly. I mean, he was a bit sort of cantankerous and, um, uh, but, and had a strange relationship with his kids, I think. Yeah. But, um, no, I, I'm, I'm, um, I, the, uh, Wizard in My Shed was written mostly at, home yeah and I've got a little office in at my house and um and it was all there I mean it is nice it's you know you need a nice safe space to go where you're not going to be bothered too much yeah um, and I've got dogs so it usually would be take the dogs to school walk the dogs and then write for like four or five hours yeah and then stop that's all that's about all you can do you know really um what was the uh, what was the feeling like when you uh, when you finally finished it because I'm, I'm thinking about i mean i'm nowhere near this standard i used to watch a film from global video killer clowns from outer space and then i'd go in on the monday and basically write the whole story with no commas no full stops <laughs> so when the teacher was trying to read my story out they looked like they were about to go have cardiac arrest um, but what was, I always remember when you finally get to the end and you put that final full stop, you know, how did it feel? Was it, were you just absolutely no, it's, always, it's always a nice feeling. But usually you've got to, usually you've got to send it to your editor and then it's, and then you, you feel it's never really finished. It's the same yeah. with writing a screenplay. You go, you go, you get a great satisfaction at the end of it. But yeah. someone once said writing is rewriting. Yeah. And that's very true. Like it, it's hard to know when it is finished because someone will always go, oh, um, we've given it to so-and-so and they said you should change this or that. Yeah. And then obviously you, get, you don't have to, but you go, yeah, that probably is a good idea. Like, it's great to listen to people is a good bit of advice. Like, yeah, it's very easy to go, hey, I know how this story goes and I know it, so I know the best way to tell it. But you do have to listen to your editors and 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 give it to people. To, I gave it to a, a lot of kids to read and yeah. and got their feedback. And um, well, they may not be the hardest critics. Well. The kids. You what? are. So it, obviously, with our podcast, most are listened to by teachers. So you know, if you had to give sort of three top tips to any children who want to be aspiring authors when they're older, what would you? three top tips be? Um, it would be, um, it would be plan your story. Yeah. Don't just start writing killer clowns and not stop. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> Have it all planned out. So planning is, is, is good. And it sounds sort of boring, but it's actually great because you get to tell the whole story yeah. in your head first, yeah, you know, or on the page. Plan it out, and then yeah. And another one is um, get advice. You know, don't be afraid of asking people what they think. Mm -hmm. Let people read it. You know, even though it can be painful, um, getting people to read it, and um, uh, and I suppose reading other books, reading things, feeding your mind. Yeah. 
not just with YouTube clips and you know, yeah, um, but try and get a varied sort of input because you, 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 your brain absorbs everything it sees, and you know, so even going for a walk in the woods or whatever, and you know, can be can be good for you. And don't just do one thing, you know. Don't just you know watch Friends on a loop. Just finishing the interview with a bit of shade there. <laughs> well, no, but uh, no, but actually, it is great. Like, fr it, Friends is so brilliantly constructed, and the jokes are so great. And the, like, I love Friends, but watch a bit of it, and then watch, you know, a nature documentary, or yeah. like read about something else. You know, try and. I mean, I, I'm as bad as anyone else. You know, I. I I'd just watch Seinfeld or, you know, <laughs> yeah. or kind of, um, you know, disaster movies. But um, uh, try and get a varied experience and, and get advice and, and plan. Yeah. Be, be um, thing. So do you want to tell us when the book is going to be released? It is out. First of October. Super. Um, in hardback. And um, available in all good stores. <laughs> it's, 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 I think it's going to be, like, I'm not just saying it, but how excited my deputy head was, and she's really into a box. You know, just the way you described it there with the characters. I mean, I'm not, as you can probably tell, I'm not well read. <laughs> but um, I think the way you've, you've spoke about it and just how it, how it looks just from the cover, because I'm a big cover guy. <laughs> I'm a big picture guy. But no, always, always, always judge your book by its cover. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I just think I just think it looks brilliant. I think it'll be a massive hit with uh, with kids. Oh, thanks, guys. Uh, yeah. No, will you let me let me know? Uh, I want I want to know what you think. Yeah, when we'll you, do. When you finally read it, both of you, let yeah, us know. We'll Send us an email or something, and um, absolutely, it's really great chatting to you. And thank thanks for. Uh, your enthusiasm about the book and all my other stuff. It's, it's, oh, no, uh, thank you. Uh, it's been a pleasure. We've never done an interview No, before. we've never done it. We wanted to ask you what the, you know, how have we been as, as sort of hosts? You've been our guest. <laughs> we, we want you, you said, ask good, yeah, you think asking. Good to to. It's a, it's, um, it's a, it's a looser, more chatty thing yeah. than, an, than an interview, but that's what, that's a podcast, isn't it? Yeah, true, true. No, it's good. It's been really good talking to you. Oh, uh, thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Thank you. So, yeah, Wizard in My Shed, available from October. on October 1st. Thank you very much, Simon. Really, really appreciate that. Top man. Take care. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Nice to meet you. You too.